Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Mipple University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Twilight Inscription, a game by James Niffen and published by Fantasy Flight Games. Let's get to the game! Set in the Twilight Imperium universe, Twilight Inscription is perhaps the first fully involved 4x roll and write. As your own unique faction, you will use the resources on these dice to increase your empire over five stages of play. As you explore the galaxy, expand your empire to its planets, exploit those planets for their industry and resources, and fight wars with your neighbours to exterminate. The player with the most points after the throne is taken wins the game. To set up, give each player one copy of each of the four sheets, Navigation, Expansion, Industry and Warfare. There are eight numbered copies of each, and you don't need to give each player a matching set. The board's A sides are asymmetrical, and all B sides are the same. Deal each player a faction card, which will give you some unique abilities. If there is a setup effect among your abilities, resolve it now. These can be good or bad. The central board represents Mechatol Rex, which is the most resource-rich planet in the middle of the galaxy. If you're playing with three or more players, you'll use this side of the board. Nearby, you'll place the Relic deck, which is shuffled face down. You'll place three Agenda cards, one for each of stages 2, 3 and 4, also face down. Place four Objective cards, one of each colour, and each of these represents one of your four sheets, at the top of the board, making sure it's flipped to the side, which shows both a higher and lower number of points and you'll prepare and place the event deck. This deck is made of alternating blue and black backed cards starting from stage 1 and going through to stage 5. Choose a speaker, and this is the player who will essentially run the game. There's no benefits to being the speaker. You're now ready to play. Twilight Inscription plays in a total of either 23 or 24 rounds, which are controlled by these event cards. There will be either 13 or 14 strategy rounds, and these are your typical roll and write types of rounds. There will be a roll of dice, and players will use the symbols to make marks on one of their sheets. The other 10 rounds are different types of intermediate scoring. There will be three production rounds, where you'll convert your production icons to trade goods for later use or points. There will be three council rounds, where you'll use any votes that you've gathered to vote with or against the other players on which of this round's agenda items you want to occur. And there'll be four war events, and this will always include the very last event in the game, and this is where you'll use the military units you've built on your warfare board to fight a war against your neighbour to the left and right. For all of your other actions, your primary aim will be to unlock anywhere that you see these stars. These represent your victory points, and whoever earns the most points will win the game. So let's first take a look at the basics of taking a strategy turn. In Twilight Inscription, there are three different resources. Materials, which are represented by a pink icon, Influence, which is blue, and Research, which is green. On most strategy turns, you'll gain access to some of these resources, and you'll spend them either by crossing out the corresponding icon somewhere on your sheet, or by taking the action which corresponds to that icon on that sheet. The first step of any round is to flip the next event card, and you'll know that it's a strategy round if it has any of the game's resources showing in the bottom left corner. Simultaneously and without looking at each other, each player now chooses one of their four sheets to be the active sheet for the round, and spends those resources that were showing on the card. Players should leave their markers on that board. This is still the active sheet for the rest of the round. Next, the speaker rolls the six dice. The three black dice offer resources which all players may now use. The three coloured dice are called focus dice, and players can only use these if they've unlocked that specific die on their active sheet. We'll cover exactly how you do this later on, but it would be represented by underlined next to the corresponding dice in these sections. 
So right now, this player is active in navigation and can only spend these resources. But if this had previously been unlocked, then the green die would also be available to this player. Then, again simultaneously and without looking at each other, players spend all of their valid resources somewhere on their current active sheet. Once all players have finished marking, you'll move on to the next round. The anatomy of these dice is important. Each black die has three materials, it being the most common resource, two influence, and one research. Each focus die has four sides showing one of its coloured resource, and two sides showing two. Certain types of mark that you'll make in the game are limited only to your current active sheet. This includes crossing off any icon which is not inside a circle, underlining any die, making an action mark specific to that sheet's action, or circling an asset. Any icon inside either a dotted or dashed circle is considered an asset. When you circle an asset which has dotted lines, then you resolve that icon immediately, and often this will be on a different board. Then immediately cross it out. When you gain an asset inside a dashed line, then you keep that asset unspent. You can spend that on a current or future strategy turn by crossing it off from either an active or inactive sheet, and then crossing out the matching icon which is not inside an asset circle on that round's active sheet. What I just showed you there was spending a navigation asset on a turn where the expansion board was the active sheet. Many of these dashed assets have different effects on different active sheets, giving you the option to choose where you spend it. A victory point asset is also a dashed circle, but you'll never spend that during the game. You'll simply leave it circled, and then cross them out when counting them at game's end. For the purposes of these rules, treat this section of the industry board, and this section of the expansion board, as if they don't belong to their sheets. In other words, you can mark assets off on these, whether it's the active or inactive sheet. This little section at the top of the expansion sheet is there to help you keep track of which resources you've spent this round. You don't have to use it, but it's a good way of keeping track if you've got a complex turn, and you erase this specific section at the end of each turn. Finally, I'll highlight one simple and important asset you can use on any strategy turn the trade goods on the industry sheet. These act as an extra wild resource. Simply spend one trade good to gain an extra material, influence, or research on the active sheet. So now let's look at each sheet in detail. On the navigation board, you'll be exploring the galaxy, looking for new systems. A material or research resource will let you explore. Draw one line from an explored system to an adjacent system along one hyperlane. For an influence, you'll be able to claim one explored system, and to do this, draw a circle around a system which is connected to your home through your exploration. You can also spend a research resource to develop technologies. And this is an option on all four sheets. Simply use it to cross out one research icon in one of the sheet's two technologies. A technology becomes available once you've crossed out all three research icons next to it, or if you spend its matching specialist asset. Once you have integrated economy, every time navigation is your active sheet, you can claim up to two explored small systems for free. And once you have gravity drive, you can take an explore action to explore through a wormhole draw into a wormhole that you can reach, and then draw out of any other one wormhole on your sheet. Each wormhole can be used only once. There are several assets unique to this board. When you claim the Mechatol Rex system, write your faction's name in the highest remaining space on the Mechatol Rex board. Gain votes on the industry board equal to the slot, and mark your slot's victory point value on your navigation board. 
If multiple players achieve this in the same step of the same round, that is during the same card resolution phase or the same dice resolution phase, all gain the higher reward. When you gain a relic asset, draw one card from the relic deck. This will have a number of victory points showing, which you write next to the relic marker, and this will be between two and six, as well as an immediate or once-off benefit you can use. Hold the card secretly in hand until you use it, and keep it face up thereafter. Then there is the planet asset, and you need to gain this on the navigation board to unlock most of your expansion board, and that's what we'll talk about next. The expansion board has three main sections, the planets, the space docks, and the technologies. You can always use the space docks. Spend resources by crossing them out in order to gain the asset shown at the end of the row, and this will be a focus die. You can also spend a planet asset from your navigation board to skip the queue entirely and gain the die. You can spend these now or on a future turn to gain permanent access to that focus die on that turn's active sheet. You cannot expand to any of the planets on the expansion board until you spend a planet asset from navigation to unlock that planet. Once a planet has been unlocked, you can spend a resource to cross out the matching resource on that planet's surface. Once you've crossed out every resource in either a column or row, then you gain the asset at the end of that column or row. Among the assets you can gain from here are the population, which will allow you to start circling victory point assets up the population track, counselors, which will let you activate the next counselor on the industry sheet, and this is a major source of specialist icons, mostly used for gaining technologies. The neural motivator will let you cross out an extra material or influence on a row that will give you a population every time this is the active sheet, while with self-assembly routines active, you can cross out one asset that you haven't claimed in order to cross out two resources on that same planet. Again, once per time, this is the active sheet. The industry sheet is a sort of grid expansion puzzle that you'll be playing to try mostly to gain commodities and counselors shown down the bottom of the industry board. There are two main actions you can take. Influence or research allows you to claim a space. Circle it and gain the asset shown. Materials allow you to scrap a space. Put a cross through it and do not gain the asset shown. When you place a circle, it must go next to an existing cross. When you place a cross, it can go next to either an existing cross or an existing circle. So while you will of course prefer to claim these spaces and gain the assets, that's not always going to be possible. Since circles cannot go next to only circles, you'll need to scrap some spaces to effectively expand around the map. Most of what you'll be gaining is commodities or counsellors, and when you gain them you simply cross off the next one from left to right on this track. When you've filled in every space in a column, then you may gain a trade good production. When you fill in every space to the left of a victory point asset, then you gain that asset. Some spaces on the industry track give you double commodities rather than single, and this track is also a rich source of bonus focus dice. When you spend a specialist asset, you can use that to create a new scrapped starting point for your expansion on this grid. And this is the only way to reach some of these richer spaces off the main grid. You can also spend a blue specialization to do four scraps, or a yellow one to do three claims. Psychoarchaeology lets you scrap or claim one counselor space each time this sheet is active. And with algorithm development, you automatically claim any space for free, that is without spending a resource, as soon as it is adjacent to three scrapped spaces. The final sheet is Warfare, and primarily you'll be spending your resources in order to build units that you'll place on your Warfare grid. 
There are five types of units, but you won't be allowed to start working on Dreadnoughts or War Sons until you unlock them by spending the matching specialist asset. To deploy infantry, simply spend one resource and deploy the infantry. For all other units, you'll need to spend the matching resources to cross off all of the required resources on these tracks. Once you've finished a track, then you deploy. These three types of units also give you victory points as soon as you deploy them. At the bottom of your grid is the deployment line, and when you place a unit, it must be placed either in the first row above the deployment line, or adjacent to any other previous unit. Units can be freely rotated however you'd like. The assets shown on this grid can be gained by placing a unit through them. So, for example, if I were to deploy this cruiser, in addition to the victory point asset, I could draw that cruiser in this orientation like so. Units are not allowed to overlap existing units and are not allowed to overlap these red circled anomaly nodes. With transit diodes, you can deploy two infantry every time this is the active sheet, and fleet logistics will increase your strength in war if you meet its requirements. The more units you have, the stronger you'll be in the wars, but we'll talk about the war events a little bit later. There's a few other assets and rules for the strategy phase that we're yet to discuss. Each of the four sheets has one objective associated with it. The first player to meet an objective marks the higher objective score in the objective section on that sheet's scoring track. Then flip the objective card, leaving only the lower score for all future players who achieve it. As for Mechatol Rex, if multiple players achieve the objective in the same step of the same round, all gain the higher reward. This asset here is a neighbor asset. And this one would give you plus one strength in wars against your right neighbor. Add a plus one to the war box of each remaining war against the appropriate neighbor. This is the faction asset. And when you gain it, you can immediately do your faction's ability shown next to the same icon. Finally, players should remember that their faction has an ongoing ability shown in text here. Be aware that not all are positive, and it may actively restrict your play. There are three different types of intermediate scoring round in the game. The first and simplest is a production event, of which there will be three. All players simply gain one trade good for each trade good production that they have unlocked down the bottom of the industry track. Second is the council event. When this happens, Players first gain one vote asset for each councillor they've unlocked on the industry track. Now flip the next agenda card, and this will have two possible outcomes, one labelled pass and one labelled fail. These will either be two different positive effects or two different negative effects. Secretly, players declare a number of votes that they'll spend and whether they want it to pass or fail. You may choose not to vote. Players announce their votes, and all of the passes and fails are tallied up. Whichever gains more votes is resolved for all players. If tied, the speaker rolls a die, and pass is resolved for a material, fail for any other icon. Finally, players spend all of the votes that they cast, and erase the voting box ahead of the next council. The final type of event is a war event, and you will fight a war against each of your two neighbours. You will not interact with any other players at the table other than those to your direct left and right. First advance the deployment line by drawing a new line on the next dashed line up the page. From now on, players will start deploying adjacent to this line instead of the one at the bottom of the page, and you cannot deploy below the line. Next, count up your strength in the war by counting the total number of nodes within that section of the board that have your units on it. So for your stage two war against the left player, this would be a total of four nodes. Against the right player, this is one, two, three, four, five nodes, plus one for the neighbor asset from the navigation board, 
giving a total of six. You resolve only the box immediately below the deployment line. For the phase three war, you would count only this box, not the sum of both boxes. Now compare with your neighbors. Whoever has the highest strength among the pair gains the asset at the top, and the lower gains the negative one victory point asset. If tied, neither player gains an asset. The game end is triggered when the a throne for the taking event is drawn. This is a blue five card, so it will either be the 23rd event, or the 23rd event will be Empire Ascendant, which is simply discarded with no effect. After which you would do one more strategy event, and then resolve the throne for the taking. For this event, you'll resolve a normal war event, and then the game is over, and players calculate their final scores. Each of your sheets will already show how many points you've gained from that sheet's objective. Then count up, crossing out as you go, all of the victory points on that sheet. For the navigation board, this will be any systems, including relics and mechatol rex, showing points. On expansion, points come from your population. For industry, points come from assets you've unlocked on the industry chart, as well as one point for every two leftover trade goods. And in warfare, points come from units you've deployed, assets you've circled on the grid, and any points you've gained or lost as spoils of war. The player with the highest score wins. If tied, whoever has the most leftover votes breaks the tie, and if still tied, victory is shared. If playing with one or two players, then you'll need to involve the bot player, and you'll use this side of the Mechatol Rex board. The bot uses these tracks to determine its strength in wars and votes at the council, and to create competition for the objectives and Mechatol Rex. The only change to setup is that you'll shuffle and place the entire agenda deck rather than choosing a single agenda. In a normal strategy round, after the dice have been rolled, the speaker will mark off the corresponding icon from the three focus dice on the Mechatol Rex board. Here it would be single material, single influence, and single research. You ignore the black dice for the purpose of the bot. If a track is completely full, then these symbols tell you how to treat that symbol if rolled again. If all steps to the left of an objective icon are crossed out, then you'll circle that objective asset for the bot and treat it as if it was resolved in the dice phase of that round. So any other players who gain it this round will score it, and then you flip it to the lower scoring side. In the case of Mechatol Rex, the bot takes the higher scoring portion of the Mechatol Rex board. When a war event is drawn, cross out the remaining boxes in that stage's war track and the highest number that was crossed out becomes the bot's strength for this war. At two players, you will have chosen at the start of the game whether the bot is your left or right neighbor. In solo, the bot is both neighbors. You otherwise resolve the war in the usual way. Council events are quite different. Flip the top agenda card, and then note to see whether it has a star or no star next to the words pass and fail. Then draw cards from the top of the deck until you find a card that is the opposite. So you'll have one with no star and one with a star. Place the speaker card over the center so you can see a pass and a fail, one with a star and one without. The way these cards work is that the star effects are always positive and the non-star effects are negative, regardless of whether it's pass or fail. Each player will now be casting votes against the bot trying to get enough votes to resolve the positive effect. First, write down the number of votes you wish to spend without marking pass or fail. Now check the bot's vote track. Again, cross out any unused boxes and the number of votes starts at the highest number crossed. You'll then additionally roll one black die and add a number of votes based on the resource rolled. So here it's influence, which is plus one vote, a total of five. If you cast more votes than the bot, then resolve the star effect. If you cast equal or fewer, resolve the unstart effect. Finally, you can adjust the bot's difficulty in setup. 
For an easy game, start with a clean sheet. For medium, cross out the leftmost step on each of these goal tracks, plus the leftmost boxes in stage two and three strength. For a hard game, cross out the second box as well on each of the goal tracks, and the second box in the stage two and three vote tracks. The bot score essentially comes from this table in the rulebook, depending on your difficulty. In a two-player game, the player with the higher score wins, as long as you exceed the minimum requirement for your difficulty. At solo, simply avoid the lost score, and then try to get the highest score you can. And that's how to play Twilight Inscription. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you want to check out our review, there's a link to that in the description below. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us, you can also hit the meeple in the corner to do that, and hit the bell icon so you'll know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. Comments, suggestions and feedback are all welcome in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, see you next time!